Well, let's just get rolling here. Let's get going here. Anything else, if anybody else wanders in, just let me let's burn it down. Yep. Yep. Okay. The Committee on Homeland Security, Subcommittee on Transportation and Protective Security will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to examine TSA's fiscal year 2019 budget request. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. The Transportation Security Administration remains one of the most crucial components to securing the homeland against new and evolving threats to the traveling public and our way of life. That is why it is incumbent upon this committee, subcommittee to take a serious look at the recently submitted fiscal year 2019 budget request to Congress, by which we are provided the opportunity to understand the administration's priorities as it relates to transportation security. This year's budget request stands at $7.7 .7 billion for fiscal year 2019, which is a $143.8 million increase from last year's request and approximately $500 million higher than currently enacted funding levels. I believe that this budget supports TSA's central mission of protecting the nation's transportation systems, and I am pleased to see the administration better allocating resources based on risks and current threats than prior years. Under the leadership of Administrator Prokoski, it has become clear that TSA continues to move in the right direction by working to raise aviation security standards around the world and recognizing that we are only as secure as our weakest link. At a time when threats to aviation remain troublingly persistent, I am pleased to see Administrator Prokoski taking necessary steps to improve TSA programs, processes, and technologies. However, I do have a number of concerns with some of the proposed budgetary numbers in this year's request. For instance, the request for funding to secure 145 computed tomography systems seems woefully short of what is needed to adequately deploy this advanced technology to airport checkpoints. While I'm, well, I should note that there's about over 2,500 actual uh, machines that need to be replaced nationwide, so 145 just seems like too much of a drop in the bucket. While I'm pleased that recently enacted appropriations for 2018 provided additional resources for CT deployment, I intend to continue pressing this issue for fiscal year 2019. Additionally, continuing on the theme from last year's budget request, the administration is proposing further cuts to its law enforcement officer reimbursement program. This program provides critical funding to state and local law enforcement entities charged with ensuring the safety and security of America's airports, including TSA personnel. At a time when public area security remains a top concern, I find this proposal to be insufficient. Lastly, TSA's proposed cuts to its surface transportation security program come just after the 2017 attempted suicide attack at New York City's Port Authority bus terminal, where bus and mass transit commuters were targeted. While I agree that TSA has consistently been unable to demonstrate the security effectiveness of the agency's Viper teams or surface inspectors, I believe the agency should work to ensure sufficient resources and support for surface transportation in other ways. Simply put, combining these cuts with additional cuts to the Transportation Security Grant Program elsewhere in the Department of Homeland Security's budget request seems out of step with the vulnerability of service transportation systems. That is why the House recently passed a number of committee bills aimed at ensuring TSA prioritizes surface transportation. Despite these challenges, I believe that in general, TSA is making great strides to improve risk-based security and is better reflecting risk in the budget than in prior years. I hope that TSA will continue working to be even more responsive to changing threats and that Administrator Prokoski will continue to set a tone that encourages regular engagement with stakeholders and empowers frontline personnel. Administrator Prokoski, you have a lot of work cut out for you, as you well know, and I hope you will use your position to root out problems at TSA, whether they be programs, processes, or personnel. And having met a number of times on these issues, I'm confident that this will be the case. I'm also hopeful that the Senate gets off their butt at some point and passes a bill which allows for a five-year term for a TSA administrator. Uh, moreover, I intend to utilize this subcommittee to ensure robust oversight of TSA's programs and promote policies that will enhance the security of the traveling public and give them confidence in the homeland security enterprise. I thank the administrator for appearing before the subcommittee today, as well as our second panel, and I look forward to hearing the testimony of all of you. I'm pleased to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentle lady from New Jersey, my friend, Ms. Watson Coleman, for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent for the gentle lady from Florida, Ms. Val Demings, to be seated on this panel and allowed to question the witness. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing, and thank you also to the administrator for joining us today. 
Um, everyone here today is well aware of the serious nature of the terrorist threat facing our transportation systems. Time and time again, we are provided chilling evidence of terrorists' intent to inflict <coughs> harm against innocent Americans by attacking planes, subways, or buses. Each time we ask ourselves and our expert <coughs> witnesses, what more can we be doing to protect against such ruthless attacks? And over and over, we are told it is simply a matter of resources. We have great ideas and great security measures. We just need more funding to deploy more officers, more canines, more technology, unquote. That is why it is so disappointing that this administration's TSA budget proposal eliminates cuts or shortchanges critical security programs. I have made repeated calls for increased security for surface transportation systems. The threat is clear, as we have seen mostly in overseas attacks. But last December, the threat hit home when an attacker detonated a bomb within the New York City subway system. So how does the president's budget address this growing dangerous threat? It proposes building a border wall paid for by gutting the few programs aimed at securing surface transportation. Specifically, the president's proposed budget calls for eliminating TSA's Viper program and cutting by nearly two-thirds of the Transit Security Grant Program, which provides security funding to transit owners and operators. Let me give you another <coughs> example of where the president's budget inexplicably shortchanges security. Repeatedly, we have seen attacks occurring within public airport areas, from Brussels to Los Angeles, from Paris to New Orleans, Istanbul to Fort Lauderdale. Airports are crowded, open, critical spaces, and attacks can result in significant loss of life. So how does the president's budget address this threat? It proposes building a border wall paid for by eliminating the law enforcement officer reimbursement program, which assists local law enforcement in providing police coverage to airports and TSA checkpoints, and by shifting TSA's duties, duty to secure exit lanes to airports and local jurisdictions. Finally, when it comes to the TSA workforce, the president's budget proposal is just off base. TSA officers are overworked and underpaid. In 2017, TSA employees ranked 336 out of 339 government agencies in overall morale and dead last in satisfaction with their pay. TSA operates its own personnel and pay system and does not afford its employees the same regular salary increase and disciplinary rights enjoyed by most other federal workers. And that is just not fair. As a result, TSA deals with high attrition rates and insufficient staffing levels. In response to these problems, the president's budget proposes, you guessed it, building a border wall rather than investing in the dedicated TSA workforce and providing them the rights they deserve. Somehow, these examples are just a small sampling of problems with the budget proposal, which also fails to invest adequately in computed tomography or CT machines does not increase funding for highly effective canine teams, and proposes increasing passenger security fees despite the ongoing diversion of much of those fees from TSA's appropriations. This budget proposal is a result of a president choosing to prioritize his mis misguided campaign promise to build an $18 billion border wall over urgent national security needs. And since he said Mexico was going to pay for this wall, we shouldn't even be having this discussion. It is unacceptable, and Congress must reject it. I am encouraged that the recently passed omnibus prioritizes some of our most pressing transportation security needs, providing $43 million in funding for 31 Viper teams, $45 million for the LEO reimbursement programs, and $77 million to continue securing exit lanes. That this omnibus presents such a sharp contrast to the proposed budget we are discussing today should raise some red flags. I hope that this hearing will help shed light on the devastating effects this budget would have if it were enacted. Again, I want to thank my chairman and our witnesses, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Watson Coleman. Other members of the subcommittee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We are pleased to have two distinguished panels of witnesses before us today. 
And let me remind the witnesses that their entire written statements will appear verbatim in the record. Um, in our first panel, we are pleased to have Admiral David Pekoski, the seventh TSA administrator, at least six that I've, I've uh, had as part of my time here as chair in three and a half years, which is crazy. And hopefully you're going to be here for a while. And that you're here to testify before us today on this critical topic. Uh, in his role as administrator, Mr. Pekoski is responsible for securing the nation's civil aviation system and service transportation modes. He leads a workforce of approximately 60,000 employees who work to protect the nation's transportation systems while ensuring freedom of movement for people and commerce. Prior to joining TSA, Mr. Pekoski served as a 26th Vice Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. Sir, I thank you for your service to our country and for continuing your service to your country in this current role. You are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Watson Coleman, members of this subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you this afternoon and for the opportunity to have a discussion and answer your questions with respect to TSA's budget and TSA's overall operations. The President's fiscal 19 budget reflects our highest priority funding needs in performing the critical mission of protecting our transportation system. And I'll briefly highlight some of the elements of that budget request in a moment. But before I touch on the budget, I'd like to express my appreciation for this committee for ensuring that TSA has the necessary authorities needed to secure the world's most complex and valuable transportation system. As you know, I have exercised the Security Directive and Emergency Amendment authorities provided in ATSA several times in my eight months as the administrator. Uh, I exercise those authorities to meet a current threat, and my policy is always to consult with industry in advance of issuing security directives or emergency amendments. And I appreciate the excellent collaboration that exists between the industry and TSA. But it is important, in my view, to retain the broad authorities granted in law to ensure that we can quickly act and decisively act when needed, and I appreciate this committee's support in that regard. I appreciate your work in passing a reauthorization bill for TSA through the House, and consistent with your priorities, I am focused on the insider threat in our aviation system and have asked our Aviation Security Advisory Committee to undertake another review of this issue. Your support of the wrap-back process has already improved security at our airports. We have launched a third-party canine cargo program recently to facilitate the use of canines in cargo security. Our third industry day is next week down at our canine training center in San Antonio, and I would say that the collaboration with industry on this topic has been excellent. We have a new strategy for TSA that focuses on improving security, accelerating our decision-making and technology deployment processes, and firmly committing to the deployment and support, a development and support, rather, of our workforce, all priorities this committee has long advocated. Additionally, I appreciate the oversight this committee provides TSA, and I have hope you found me and my team highly responsive to your request for information since our January hearing. I'd like to, at this point, highlight a few items in the President's budget request. Um, first, the budget begins full-scale deployment uh, funding for the administration's and this committee's top priority, as the Chairman already mentioned, the uh, computer tomography x-ray equipment at domestic airport checkpoints. This program is on track. Uh, we have five participating vendors. Uh, of the five, two are small businesses. The next phase of this project is developmental and operational testing. Uh, our vendors are manufacturing the test systems now, and we expect to have approximately 35 systems either deployed at our test labs, in our training centers, or at airports uh, over the course of this summer. If all the testing goes well, full-scale implementation will begin early in calendar year 19. The President's budget provides $72 million for 145 units in fiscal 19, and I am committed to successfully fielding this, te this technology as quickly as I can. The budget also provides $7 million to fund nearly 300 credential authentication technology units. Uh, these units improve the travel document checker function at our security checkpoint. That, that function is the first person that a passenger meets when they come into the TSA area of a checkpoint. 42 of these, these, these units are now being tested in select pre-check lanes in 13 airports across the country, and that testing is going very well. In total, approximately 1,500 of these units are needed. Uh, with FI-19 funding, we will have over 300 of the 1,500 to be fielded, or approximately 20 percent. Uh, both CT, the computer tomography x-ray equipment, and the credential authentication technology are key essential parts of our security checkpoint, and I appreciate the committee's full support of these mission critical systems. On surface transportation, the budget sustains our level of effort with the exception of the elimination of the Viper teams. 
And I appreciate, as you know, in my prior testimony and in my individual conversations with members of this committee, I appreciate the hard work and the value that the Viper teams have brought to both aviation and surface transportation security. The budget reflects a need simply to prioritize funding within a constrained budget and acknowledge the capability that already exists at the state and local levels. And we will continue to work closely with surface transportation system owners and operators in sharing intelligence information, developing guidelines, sharing best practices, providing canine capability, and our close work with them in exercises, training, and security summits. Uh, Long-term capital and technology planning is important to sustaining progress in deploying this technology to the hands of the users. We have developed a capital investment plan for TSA to guide our next year, our fiscal 20 budget submission, uh, now before the Department of Homeland Security. This will provide us the ability to provide a longer term and strategic look at our capital investment requirements for TSA. This technology is great and it's urgently needed, but is only useful in the hands of the outstanding men and women, some 60,000 strong who are TSA. Their role in providing a secure transportation system cannot be overstated. Through a dedication and hard work, we have maintained a secure transportation system. We have raised the bar on global aviation security. We screen roughly 2 million passengers through our domestic airports every single day, ensure compliance with our regulations, and introduce new leading edge security into the checkpoint. TSA's workforce is at the core of our new strategy, and I am keenly focused on increasing job satisfaction, morale, improving communications, and soliciting their ideas for a better TSA, as well as providing professional leadership development to our workforce. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to make an opening statement, and I look forward to your question, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bukowski. I, I want to recognize the chairman of the, or ranking member, rather, of the Homeland Security Committee, Mr. Thompson. I don't believe he has a statement, but do you want to enter something in the record, sir? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, thank you very much. I have a written statement uh, that I would like to uh, enter into the record, and I will have some questions of the administrator at that time. Without objection. Thank you. And thank you again, uh, Admiral Prokoski. I keep calling you uh, Mr. Prokoski. You should be Admiral, I believe. Uh, we, we appreciate you being here today, and I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. And uh, to no one's surprise, I'm going to ask you some questions about pre-check and about uh, the procurement process with respect to the, uh, the CT machines, which is a next generation of scanning. Uh, the budget does allocate some uh, funding for that, and it's certainly an increase over past years. Uh, I remain concerned about the, uh, the, the lack of speed with which some of these systems are being implemented, particularly given the, the fact that these very machines, uh, Ms. Watson, Coleman, and myself, and many others saw with their own eyes uh, on, on the front lines already being implemented in Europe. And so uh, uh, if you could just talk for a second about the level of, uh, of application of machines that will go online this year, if any. I know there's going to be testing, and if there's not going to be any going online this year, when they're going to be going online, and to what extent they're going to be going online, and what else we can do to help you with that. Yes, sir. Uh, this year in, in fiscal 18, so between now and the end of September of this year, we'll have 36 systems deployed. Um, the majority of them will be deployed to the airports. And the purpose of, the, of that deployment is to operationally test the machines to make sure that they can operate uh, as they're designed. And it also gives us an opportunity to train our workforce in this new technology. Uh, I would expect that if that testing goes well, and based on everything that I know today, I expect it to, um, that we will have operational use of those machines uh, once that testing is complete. So we'll already have 35 machines installed based, based on uh, fiscal 18 funding. And then, as you know, sir, we have a fiscal 19 request that will fund 145 more machines. Uh, what, what I would also add to that, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, I'm moving as fast as I can, irrespective of what the, bu the budget levels are. Uh, my commitment to you, my commitment to the administration is uh, to deploy this technology as quickly as we can. Uh, and so the budget number doesn't meter the speed at which we're attempting to deploy this technology. And we're working very hard to do that. Uh, I have met personally with all but one of the five vendors that, that uh, have expressed an interest in supporting us in this way, and I meet with that last vendor uh, tomorrow to basically express my concern that, that we do this rapidly and in a smart way, and also to proactively seek their input on ways from their perspective that we could do this better and deploy it better. Okay, um, I, I appreciate that, but the question I have is, this technology is already being used on the front lines, and one of the things we've pushed in the past in a separate legislation, I believe, is to have third-party testing become more, more of a, a, a tool for the TSA and the TSA industries that uh, provide, provide the uh, technologies. And 
we already know that these, these things are being used in Europe. We already know they're being successfully implemented in Europe. So why, out of curiosity, why would we have to go through all this extra testing? Is that just, are these internal rules of TSA or what is it that you have to test that's not already been tested on the front lines? So we, we've been in very close contact with, uh, with folks at Schiphol Airport, at London Heathrow Airport, where they are testing these machines now. Uh, and we exchange data back and forth with both those airports so that um, uh, we can together learn how to best apply these, these systems and where we can further develop the technology uh, with software improvements. Um, and, and with respect to third-party testing, uh, I am a huge advocate of uh, covert testing, red team testing, uh, and to make sure that the system, when you don't expect to be tested, is actually working as advertised. Um, and so we will continue to do that. In fact, one of the things that, that I'm looking to do inside TSA is to expand that testing element because it has provided us such valuable insight. It allows us to change our processes and to look for new technology solutions. Thank you. As you know, uh, we, we've said this in the past, and, we'll, and I'll, I'll re it bears uh, repeating now, the bad guys are making advances at a much faster pace, and we are getting our, our technologies to the front line. So I, I implore you and everyone at TSA to work as quickly and as fast as you can with the, your respective vendors to get this stuff done. We're also going to introduce a bill that helps you expand the TSIFS capabilities so they, these things can get through the process quicker, and that's very, very important to us. Uh, briefly, I want to just reiterate my concern about pre-check, um, and I don't know if there's any provisions in the budget to address this concern, but pre-check should be for pre-check, and Mr. Thompson, I know, has expressed concerns about this in the past, as has uh, Ms. watson Coleman, myself, and Chairman McCall and others, that uh, when someone goes through a pre-check line under any circumstance that has not, is not being fully vetted and is not part of the pre-check program, uh, that is a mistake, that is a security gap, and that shouldn't happen. And I'd venture to guess that's part of the reason why pre-check isn't expanding at the rate upon which we want it to. So uh, just briefly, can you tell me, is there any provisions in this budget to address those concerns? So there are no provisions in the budget, but I really don't need a budget provision to address the concerns that you've expressed. In fact, we're already moving uh, in that direction, and, and we will gradually get to the point in the not-too-distant future where only people with pre-check on their boarding pass are in pre-check lanes. Uh, and then there's a, an additional step to ensure that only pre-check registrants are in pre-check lanes. Uh, so I'd be happy to get you a timeline for how we, how we intend to advance that, uh, but it will be aggressive. I would like to see that timeline, and I appreciate that. And again, just because they say pre-check on the boarding pass doesn't mean they're in the pre-check program, so we want right. that stopped as well. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Thompson for five minutes of questioning. Uh, uh, chair, uh, good to see you again, Mr. Administrator. Um, are you in support of this budget you hear here defending? Yes, sir, I support the President's request. Okay. So you support getting rid of the Viper teams? Sir, with, within the available funding for TSA, we had to make some very uh, difficult trade-offs. I am a strong supporter of the Viper teams, but we just can't afford to continue to provide that level of support. And, and additionally, knowing that state and local governments uh, also have uh, capability similar to what the Viper teams provide, but in no, that in no way diminishes, in my view, the value of the Viper teams or the or the work that they perform. So, are you support them, or you want to get rid of them? I'm supportive of the president's request that necessarily, based on funding limitations, um, would, would eliminate the Viper teams and turn that responsibility uh, with that capability gap to, to state and local governments, sir. So do you support uh, workers having uh, the same, your workers having the same rights as other fellow employees? Uh, sir, I, I, the, the rights uh, TSA workers have within the Aviation and Transportation Security Act uh, are substantial. And I, I think that if you, if you looked at my actions since I've been the administrator, I have done uh, a lot of things to ensure that our workers' rights are well protected and well considered. Uh, and, and I'm constantly looking at ways that we can improve job satisfaction and morale uh, within TSA, and I think we've made some good progress in that regard. So if I said TSA officers uh, don't receive regular scheduled salary increases, would I be correct? Not entirely, sir. Uh, with, with the Aviation and Transportation Security Act allows me to pay at any time that I want to pay at what level that I want to pay. Uh, the issue really is how much money do you have within your budget to be able to pay your workforce. So do you do it or, or do you do don't it. do it? We do do it, yes, sir. We, we, we give our workers a pay raise uh, every year. Um, 
Unlike the general schedule, which has longevity increases over a set period of time, I have the authority within TSA to provide longevity increases every year if I choose to do that. The issue is not the authority to do it, it's the ability with respect to funding to, to pay workers. So do you do longevity pay? We don't do longevity pay. What well, we do do annual pay increases. So the record will reflect that annual increases uh, are the standard procedure. Yes, sir, for, for high-performing employees. that Not all employees get, the vast majority do, but not all employees do. Because we, we have a pay well, for performance system. Well, if you would uh, provide in writing, I think, to the committee uh, how employees receive regular scheduled pay increases. Yes, sir, we'll do. Uh, I, so uh, do employees have access to fair uh, disciplinary appeal process? Yes, sir, they do. There's a grievance process within, within TSA. It's the National Resolution um, Committee, and uh, that process, in my view, is working very well. In fact, uh, we just compared National Resolution Center processes to the Merit Systems Protection Board in terms of the uh, end results of whether they accepted a, a grievance or not, and our comparison is on par with, in general, for, for a large population, on par with the, what the MSPB does. Additionally, the, uh, the NRC, the internal grievance resolution process within TSA processes those applications quite a bit faster. So if, if people get um, uh, fair hearings, if they're getting increases, if they're getting longevity pay, why is morale so bad among your agency? Well, because the, the overall level, sir, they, they get the annual increases, but the annual increases may not be at the same level in terms of absolute dollars or a percentage of pay that they might get in a different system. And that's, that, that is not an authority's issue. It's, it's a dollars issue. Do you have authority to fix it? I have the authority to pay it if I had the money to pay. So you support the president's budget, mm -hmm. but you don't have the money to pay your employees. That's right, because the, it, within the president's budget, sir, I, I have a certain amount of money, $7.7 .7 billion. So you do understand to, that do. has a direct correlation mm -hmm. to morale. I do, sir. In fact, I, th I think the key driver um, for the morale numbers that the ranking member cited in her opening statement uh, are due to pay. Um, but th that pay is at the, at the lower pay bands, because we have a banded system uh, for pay. That, that pay is most acute at the lower pay bands. You support the pay band? I do rather than paying your government employees like we pay all other government employees? Well, so there, there's, there, in my mind, there are two different things. Uh, the pay bans as, as a way to manage a pay-for-performance system that provides security is a very good way to do it. Uh, whether or not you have the money to pay all that you would desire to pay is an entirely different question. Why would you want a system mm -hmm. of paying your employees different from all other federal employees? because I would, I would like to recognize performance. If somebody performs well, I'd like to be able to, to quickly recognize that performance with pay. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Chairman now recognizes the Ranking Member, Ms. watson Coleman for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good day to you, Mr. Administrator. Yeah. Um, I have to tell you that I'm, 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 I'm a little disturbed here um, about some of what I think are is an about face on what's important and what represents um, security at our airports and other places. You said in your opening statement, this budget supports our highest priority funding needs and allows TSA to continue its critical mission of protecting America's transportation system. Yet when we, we review the budget, we see that there is a decrease in local and uh, law enforcement um, support. There is a, an elimination of Viper, which is something that up until this point you had indicated was a very important um, component to security um, either at airports or at surface transportation facilities. It diminishes uh, significantly surface grants, sometimes the only grants that are available to uh, transportation systems, um, land transportation system. It increases the fees, but there's no guarantee that TSA is going to get more of that money. There's no increase in salary, salaries and a modest increase in the number of positions. And inadequate funding of the CTs based upon 
prior conversations, Mr. Administrator. Um, so are you suggesting that the border is more important than these issues, um, these security measures that we supported for purposes of securing people flying, riding, walking, whatever? I'm, I'm just really confused here. Yes, ma'am. Well, well, I would suggest all are very important. And we don't have unlimited funds in the federal government, and we have to make some very difficult choices. So do you think that diversion of the money to build a border wall is more important than putting adequate money in these seven or eight or nine or ten items that are woefully um, either underrepresented in this budget or eliminated entirely, sir? Well, my, my, my job is to advocate strongly for the Transportation Security Administration budget, and, and I do that in the process. And, and uh, then others with a broader portfolio and a broader view make decisions as to which part of the, the overall DHS enterprise get uh, different levels of funding. You know, Mr. Um, Administrator, I had a lot of um, uh, uh, a hope and expectations mm -hmm. of uh, your being able to, to do that. But today, it concerns me that you are a team member and a team that I think is taking this country in the wrong direction. And it's, it's kind of disappointing, actually. So I, I just need to put that on the record. Um, at, our, at your last appearance before the subcommittee, you agreed to provide us with information on political appointees at TSA who have recused themselves from working on certain issues under your leadership and during the, the prior administration. And I thank you for provide, providing that information. The data provided showed that between 2012 and 2017, there were seven political appointments at TSA with relationships with 27 organizations that could trigger recusals. In contrast, in just the year or so since this current president took office, nine individuals who collectively could have conflicts associated with 70 organizations have cycled through to TSA as political appointees. Further, since 2015, the number of political appointee positions at TSA has doubled from four to eight. Yes, four to eight. So, sir, let me ask you, from, let me say that from what I've seen on this committee and my work on the oversight committee, this president's policy of hiring lobbyists into the federal government and a pension for cabinet secretaries who have dubious relationships with ethics, with ethics and physical responsibility as well as representing whether or not they are even eligible for the positions they hold, present company accepted. I uh, certainly do not reflect a desire to drain the swamp and as such I wanna ask you, why did you create new political positions within TSA, an agency who needs to be apolitical to protect transportation systems, regardless of who is in the White House? What are the responsibilities of these political appointees within TSA, and how is TSA navigating the extensive recusal issues associated with so many of these people in key positions? Yes, ma'am. We have uh, nine political appointees in TSA, a workforce of 60-plus thousand people. So on a percentage basis, that's a very, very small percentage. Uh, you're right, ma'am, that, uh, that there are more political appointees in TSA than there were a year ago. Uh, all of the new ads on the political appointee side are in my office as counselors to me. Um, and I brought those people in who are all outstanding individuals, um, brought them in to advise me uh, and to assist me in, in, in the leadership of TSA. Uh, with respect to recusals, I'm recused from some aspects of, of my job, and those recusals, in my view, serve a very useful purpose to make sure that there are no conflicts of interest and that we are fair and above board. And with the recusals, there is a very deliberate process to allow decisions to continue to be made by other officials within the agency uh, for a period of time. The final thing I'd say, ma'am, is that the recusals don't last forever. Um, my recusal, I, I can speak for myself, uh, my recusals last for two years. Um, and so for two years, there's another process that we put in place that allows decisions on those topics to be made by somebody else, not me, and I'm shielded from that information so that there is no undue influence. I actually think that's a very good process. Thank you, Ms. watson Coleman. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Pekoski, thank you for your service, sir, to our nation, the nation that we love. Thank you for your continued service. Are you a recipient of the, of the Distinguished Service Medal through your time in the Coast Guard? Yes, sir, I am. Congratulations, sir, and thank you for your service. Legion of Merit? Yes, sir. Congratulations, and thank you for your service. During your time in the Coast Guard, the teams that you ran, was their morale high? Very high, yes, sir. 
their their service uh, to their country in the, in the Coast Guard called for incredible training at jobs that had equivalent jobs in the civilian world. Is that correct? That's correct. Their pay in the Coast Guard was it equivalent to the to their service in the civilian world in the same job? Not by a long shot. Was their morale high? Morale was high. Thank you. Let us move on. Mm -hmm. Much of our focus today is on issues that the public normally associates with TSA, such as airport security. But I'd like to talk about pipeline security. Currently in Louisiana, especially in my district, we're experiencing a drastic and much welcome increase in private investment into our energy industry, much of which has manifested itself in the form of new liquefied natural gas facilities. These new facilities have led to the construction and proposed construction of new pipelines in the area, hundreds and hundreds of miles of pipeline. Your agency has security responsibilities for the 2.6 million miles of natural gas and oil pipelines in our nation. With the current administration's focus on regaining American energy dominance, this number is likely to grow. These pipelines are subject to threat. For example, a new pipeline endeavor in my district called the Bayou Bridge has been met with large resistance from environmental groups, mostly from outside of my state. And these activists have gone beyond stage protest and have at times escalated their activities towards vandalism in attempts to sabotage or delay the project, which they have. In one instance, as reported by the Sheriff's Office, the protesters caused over $50,000 in damage to the pipeline's construction site. My question to you is what is TSA's role in promoting pipeline security, especially for new projects, and how can the agency better track and respond to evolving threats that may target pipelines? So we have a very critical role in providing for pipeline security by working very closely with the pipeline industry uh, in sharing intelligence information with them, uh, in sharing best, best practices across com companies where appropriate. Uh, additionally, we just published some pipeline security guidelines uh, went out last month uh, that was a collaborative effort between TSA and the pipeline industry, all the companies that participate in that industry. Uh, it's an excellent document. I'd be happy to pro provide you a copy of it, sir. But I find that voluntary guidelines uh, in this regard actually get us further towards a good security solution than perhaps regulations would. What is the level of coordination? And thank you for your answer. That was very thorough. What is the level of coordination with local law enforcement uh, to, to be force multipliers for pipeline security across the country? So whenever we do training exercises, we always involve local law enforcement because that's a key opportunity for all of us to coordinate and to get to know each other much better. And and does that training take place on a regular basis? It does, sir. Is your the, your current budget is it, does that impact your 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 training? Our, our training uh, in our, in the fiscal 19 uh, budget is the same as it was in fiscal 18. So you can continue the level of training that's been established. Yes, sir. And you find that to be e effective. I find that to be effective, and I believe the industry does as well. Do you have a spirit within the TSA as the administrator with your military background, sir, to be able to do more with less? We do. I appreciate that spirit, and I appreciate the, your uh, leadership and, and your, your attitude here today. Um, we certainly recognize that, that the role of, of TSA is, is crucial to the safety of our nation and the people that we serve. We also recognize that this, the stability of our nation is dependent upon the fiscal responsibility that should be borne in this city where it seems to be a very foreign concept. So thank you for your, for your considerate responses. Uh, thank you for your leadership, sir. And Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator Pekoski, thank you for your service. Uh, in January, uh, before this committee, you testified that uh, you, would, you would like 300 uh, CT scanners, CT machines, uh, for this year. Uh, is that correct? Yes, sir. So this budget's asking for 145 mm -hmm. CT scanners. So my point uh, in part is this, that indeed, since you requested it, uh, it's feasible that you could use those and implement those. So this is purely a budgetary decision, not one of implementation, not one of constraints otherwise. Is that correct? So I don't feel any constraints with respect to the budget and how fast I implement the CT acquisition. Well, sir, it, yeah. you said you wanted 300 right. just last January. Now yes, you're sir. coming in for 145. 
Yes, sir. But the, the, the 145 number or the 300 number, I'm still going to move as fast as I can uh, to begin to begin to implement this system. I'm, I'm, I'm having I, trouble understanding. I know. You wanted 300. Right. So you assume you could use them. We know we need them. Uh, but it's 145. Yes, sir. So I, so what I may, what may happen is I may reach a point where I can deploy all 145 earlier in the fiscal year than I thought. And at that point, uh, we, we reconsider uh, the funding level, and I go back and, and talk within the administration. So uh, if you could, uh, for this committee uh, mm -hmm. and myself, if you could, show us where your initial thought was. If you can come back and say, this is where I thought I was, and this is how I thought I could do 300. And if you could, then say, this is, these are the constraints I've seen where I can only feasibly do 145. Uh, and at the same time, I think uh, the testing that's, and the actual implementation that's being done in other countries, you can't conceivably think that uh, taking advantage of that testing uh, in place couldn't expedite the process more? Could, could you conceivably, look, let's say there's no resources that are mm -hmm. problem. Could you conceivably come in with a program? Let's assume there was a disaster. Let's assume there was an attack. Let's assume that we find out in reviewing it, the CT the <coughs> scanners would have prevented that from occurring. And you were tasked with saying, we have to get these in place immediately, no constraints. Is that possible that you could do that? It's possible. It w they wouldn't uh, achieve the level of uh, detection that we desire, but it's possible to do, sir. And, and with respect to our international partners who are deploying CT, uh, we have a very robust exchange of information with them. So as we learn and they learn, we share information back and forth. Would it, yeah. uh, would it indeed be uh, something that uh, you'd be willing to share with the committee, though, how this could possibly be done uh, if there were no constraints, or how you could look beyond the box and say, we're doing this because I, I would assume if we were attacked and this happened and, and our oversight taught us that this could have been prevented, that we would be acting differently. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I know we would be acting mm -hmm. differently. So what I want to do is uh, you can only deal with what you have for resources and current constraints. If you could share with us what could be done under those circumstances, what you could think conceivably be done if you were tasked with that. We know it's a hypothetical, but our job is to look at the hypotheticals uh, and say, how can we improve things in the future? And this is one area uh, I think that, uh, I think you could use a little help from us uh, on. We can't tell you what to do, but we can give you the tools to do it. And, and we wanna do it. This is a priority, and I can't imagine we'd be acting this way. Uh, and if we didn't make the request I just did, and we didn't pursue this, we would be complicit, I think, as a committee in not doing our, our duty uh, to try and uh, make people safe. So if you could, uh, a couple of other things uh, that have been mentioned that are important, uh, that really, uh, I think, up against Congress and our history, uh, recent history, uh, will tell us there's some funding gaps here. Uh, the budgets come in eliminating, you know, the LEO funding and exit lane funding, uh, and we have great deal of discrepancies from one airport to another in the way they function and how uh, uh, secure some of those airports would be. Some of them are under authorities, municipalities, God knows what. Uh, but you've got cuts there uh, that Congress didn't go along with, so there's potentially a gap there. And there's another funding gap that's going to occur too, uh, dealing with an increase uh, uh, of the tax that's put on passengers. That's being increased from 560 one way to 660 one way. You know, that money, and there's members of the committee here, a ranking member uh, leading this, uh, to try and take that money back uh, that's there for passenger fees that's been diverted away and put that right back to airport safety. $1.25 uh, billion. Now, if we have that money, uh, we wouldn't be having to increase that. And if we're increasing it and the money's being diverted, how do we know that's going to get into uh, safety? Uh, in the last analysis, two funding areas. My final comment uh, is this, and it's one of priorities, and it's been addressed, uh, uh, but I'm going to continue to address it. How many uh, terrorist attacks have come over the Mexican border in the last five years? Uh, with respect to surface transportation radiation, No, just none. generally, just general knowledge, not under TSA. Best, best of my knowledge, none. None. That's the correct answer. Yet we've had airport attacks over the last five years five years. So diverting money to the border when money is a constraint and, and the budget cuts 
the local law enforcement. Uh, it cuts uh, the exit lane there to, uh, for uh, TSA's responsibility, which I think it is TSA's responsibility to make sure people honor in these secure areas, where it's taking away the canines and viper teams that are there. That's where we've had attacks. Yet that money that we find a multiplier effect perhaps of 25 for a border wall where there's been no attacks and where this Congress just recently put $1.6 billion to strengthen our border security and it's being potentially used for National Guardsmen who can't even arm themselves. So my question to you is, uh, not in your capacity, but otherwise, does that make any sense to you as an as a American citizen, not as an administrator? Well, sir, sir, my focus is on transportation security, and, and my job is to advocate as strongly as I can for transportation security. I have done that, uh, and the President's budget provides an adequate level of funding to provide for continued security in our transportation system. And I would just note that, that we have been very successful at that over time. Uh, we have a very robust system in place. The reductions that you see in the budget are, are really a, a reflection of, hey, this capacity exists somewhere else that perhaps the federal government no longer needs to expend funds to do this and can direct them to projects like the computer tomography. The, you know, everything in the budget uh, supports each other. And so if, if for example, uh, the Viper teams remained in the budget or if, for example, law enforcement officer reimbursement remained in the budget, I might have a lower number for CT um, just because it, 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 it's not an unlimited, you know, $7.7 .7 billion is my limit within that budget envelope. Well, Thank you, my Mr. limit Peter. is an American fatality, a person that's injured or a person that's killed in, in these kind of attacks, and there's enough money to put it elsewhere, uh, where it does absolutely no good, where we're putting uh, National Guardsmen at the border that can't even uh, use those Mr. arms, your time except is up. in self-defense. And I yield back reluctantly, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The Chair now recognizes the General from Alabama, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Admiral, thank you for being here, and thank you for your service to our country. Uh, Admiral, as Administrator of the T Transportation Security Administration, do you have uh, responsibility for securing the southwest border of the United States of America? I do not. Uh, as Administrator of the Transportation Security Administration, do you have the authority to secure the southwestern border of the United States if you wanted to do it? No, sir. So uh, other than your opinion as a private American citizen that all 350 million of us or whatever there are have, do you think anybody in the leadership of the Department of Homeland Security cares what your opinion is about whether or not resources should be put against securing the southwestern border of the United States? No, sir. I look for my opinion on transportation security. Yes, sir. And that's what we have you here for, and I appreciate you being here. As you can tell from the, the questions and, and this other than that area, this committee remains focused on CT scans being increased at the checkpoints as well as explosive detection canines. Now, you made the statement to Mr. Keating just now that the, and I, I agree with him. It's hard to, to, to explain that delta between needing 300 and, and asking for 345, 145. My guess is OMB told you 145 was the money they had the money that you could pursue. Uh, however, you made the, the statement to him that if at some point during the year you felt like you could push those 145 out and needed more, you'd revisit it. And you also made the statement to... Uh, uh, the full committee, uh, the subcommittee chairman, quote, I'm moving as fast as I can. The budget number doesn't, mat doesn't meter the pace at which I'm moving, close quote. So my question is, if, as you told Mr. Keating, if you get to a point that you've pushed all 145 out, would you be willing to pursue a reprogramming of monies to allow you to get more out to move toward that 300 goal? Yes, sir, I would. And, and in fact, um, uh, that, that's been my position all along is, is I have a certain amount of money. I have all the money I need to do the testing I need to do to be able to certify these systems and get them to a point where we want to have them uh, with respect to detectability to deploy to the checkpoint. Uh, so the funding that we have in the budget does not meter that down in one, in one, way, one way at all. Um, if we reach a point where, like I, I, I said to Mr. Keating, if we are deploying all 145 units in April of next year, then yes, I would go back to the secretary and say, I, I'm ready and I'm capable and I've proven that I have proven technology that I can integrate into a checkpoint system and an improved security. Let's look at some reprogramming options. Well, and, and, and as you know, Congress would have to concur with that, but it, I, hmm? it is obvious from this committee's behavior and, uh, and recent hearings, 
that would be approved if there was a reprogramming request. So it is my hope that you do try to get beyond that 145 and, and uh, use that reprogramming avenue. Similarly, as you might be uh, aware, I'm concerned about the canine number as well. I, I reviewed the president's budget and frankly was shocked when I, because I know we've had conversations privately as well as in the committee. You share the subcommittee's opinion about the value of explosive detection canines and the need for a much greater number of them in our airports. But then when I see the budget and I see there's only $500,000 increase uh, between FY18 and FY19, that does not reflect value. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, $500,000 is a lot of money to an individual, but in the $7 billion program, uh, it's not a big number. Why is it so low? Because $500,000 will not get you a large expanse of the canine explo explosive detection canine program. No, sir. What, what we've done is we've, we've increased the capacity of our canine training center by 50 canines per year. So that's a fairly substantial uh, increase. And the idea is to position ourselves in the out years to be able to grow the program. My challenge at this point in time, right here at, in April of, of 2018, is getting up to my allocated number. Uh, my allocated number is 379 passenger screening canines. We aren't there yet. Uh, so I'm challenged to get to that number this year. I'm not sure I can grow the program substantially in 19, given some constraints within the training system, which we're examining and trying to get to a point where we can. But to your main point, sir, is, is I am a strong supporter, as I know just about every member on this committee is of, of canine capability, and that is my goal is to increase that program. Yeah, I recently sent you a letter um, about uh, some concerns over third-party uh, canine cargo programs also doing the uh, uh, to testing. Is that a a, a, a thing I should be concerned about? No, sir. In fact, I replied, uh, sent you back a response yesterday. Uh, well, I, could you I, tell the committee what that response said? Uh, the third party canine cargo program is a very valuable program. We've had uh, two industry days already. We have a third one coming up at the canine training center next week. Um, we have valued great, greatly the input that the industry has provided us, and we're committed to ensuring that the program we roll out uh, provides the right protections. Uh, for example, a company that is certified in canines can't provide canines because um, we want to make sure that it's it's a, a completely above board um, and that there's no conflict there additionally sir you asked questions about how do we check as to whether or not they're achieving the level of performance that we desire and we have a program in place to regularly audit uh, those canines both from a records perspective and also from an on-scene perspective Perfect. thank you very much and again thank you for your service to our thank country you, thank you mr. Rogers the chair now recognize a gentleman from Kansas mr. Estes for five minutes of questioning So as, as we look forward to, to the mission of how, to, how, do we, how do we continue to process, how do we continue to, to provide the services, I, I know we've talked uh, some about uh, upgrading our technology. Uh, I was fortunate enough to look at uh, some of the last departure, ship, uh, last departure airports uh, in Europe and in the Middle East and, and some of the technology they're using there. How can we make sure that we're, we're providing the best support uh, for you as you're looking at the budget for next year, but also laying the foundation to be in a short short time frame in the future to, to help make sure that we're providing that that technology that helps you do the job that we expect you to do. Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I, I would say the, the committee's done a fantastic job in supporting TSA. Uh, since I've been the administrator, I, I, I know I can speak for my predecessor. He felt exactly the same way. Um, where you can continue to help us is uh, as we look at the processes, I'm committed to, to, to try to accelerate our process to, one, make decisions, and then once we make a decision, to deploy technology successfully, because I do think it takes us way too long to do that. Uh, I may need some authorities to be able to move th quicker through a system uh, to be able to put that in place. Um, the other thing that I'm, I'm exploring uh, very robustly, sir, is, is how can we work in public-private partnerships with industry. Uh, we've already done that pretty successfully with the automated screening lanes, those new lanes where five people can take their stuff out of their carry-on bags and put it in bins at the same time. Uh, those lanes also have some significant security enhancements. We will have about 200 of those lanes in place across our system uh, this year, and that's all funded by the industry. And so what the industry has allowed us to do is to do uh, developmental and operational testing, and training, and integration uh, where they've paid for it and then gifted the, the systems to us. So uh, something like that, a public-private partnership where we might be able to allow the industry to support some of the acquisition process, and then when we get into a point where we say, yes, this is a system we want to buy, we can just go buy it. That should shorten the timelines quite a bit. 
Well, I, I'm glad to hear you. You're talking about uh, looking for additional ways to help uh, roll things out, help implement things. Uh, you know, you, you hear some some stories. Uh, some are probably anecdotal, but others probably have real world basis of of uh, how slow this whole process is. How how uh, um, Gap, much the gap is between where we'd like to be and how fast we're getting there. So uh, that's uh, that's an opportunity to to see how do we how do we move forward in that and and how do we make sure that we use our budget resources the best way to, to make that happen. One one of the things, just just as a, a personal note, a personal comment is, uh, uh, I I would like the opportunity at some point in time to go uh, look at uh, some of the automated lanes. I've I've anecdotally uh, observed that process, but uh, trying to understand how, how well that, that uh, improves the efficiency and, and how well that, that process works. So that'd be interesting to me. Yes, sir. We welcome you uh, to any one of our facilities that has the ASLs, and we'd be happy to show you the whole, from a passenger perspective, why it's better, and really from a security perspective, why it's better, uh, and then how we're integrating. We, pl we plan to integrate those lanes, that technology, with the CT x-ray machine. All right. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Estes. The chair, I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bukowski, thanks for being here. Um, and this is really very, very important stuff we're talking about here, obviously. Uh, I think everyone knows that. <clears throat> what I would like to do is just to make sure that I'm clear uh, and that this committee is clear on what is needed and what's being offered and what the gap is and how we get to filling that gap. So I want to focus first on the CT screening devices and move to K9. So, the, the proposed budget offers, correct me if I'm wrong, $73 million for 145 CT screening devices. That's correct. Um, a full deployment, if we wanted to cover from top to bottom the airports, 450 or so in this country, would require about 2400 Is that right? That's correct. At about $600,000 a piece? That's correct. So we're looking at a, a total price tag of about $1.4 billion. Mm -hmm. And as uh, my colleague, Mr. Keating, had mentioned earlier, and it's been discussed, there's about $1.3 billion currently uh, collected in airline passenger fees that are earmarked specifically to the general fund for debt reduction. So if th that's one place we could go, right, to get this money. Um, second is on the canines. There's two types of canines, right, passenger screening and law enforcement. That's right. Could you describe the difference between the two of those? Well, passenger screening canine is, is uh, trained to walk um, through a, a series of passengers detect a vapor, whether it's an explosive vapor or any other kind of vapor that we prohibit in the, che in the check lane, and then follow that vapor to that passenger and then alert on that passenger. And then we have officers that, that behavior detection uh, trained individuals uh, that help us uh, take care of, of that passenger's issue um, as, as we go forward. And there's currently about 400 or so passenger screening just under seven. We have, we have an allocation for 379, sir, but as I said to Mr. Rogers, we don't yet have 379 on board, you know, and that's the, that's the gap we're trying to fill this year. Um, back to the, the CT scanning devices. Um, are there five or so, I understand, manufacturers of these devices, and it, and it could take several years to deploy? Yes, sir. So yep. even if we were able to, to um, uh, obtain the funds, which I think we have to because I can't think of a higher priority with all the tens of billions mm -hmm. of dollars we spent in aviation security, this is the most important thing we can do. Um, but as far as the, uh, the, the uh, not only the, getting the funding, but also the deployment, is there a problem on, on the supply side with a number of producers of these machines being able to produce enough for our demand that we have right now? Well, the good news, sir, is that we have five vendors that are that are in the competition and, and participating robustly in, in the process that we have in place. Uh, I don't know how many vendors are going to be at the end. When we get to the end and we make a decision that uh, we're going to purchase and, and certain vendors are qualified and certified by us um, to participate in that program. So really the, the volume that we can put in place depends on how many qualified vendors and then to some degree which <coughs> vendors those are because some vendors have more capacity than others do. Okay. I just want to implore the, this committee. I mean, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about it, but we got to actually take action because this is really, really important stuff. We need these screening devices in all 450 plus airports across this country. Uh, it's got to be a priority. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Fitzpatrick. The chair now recognizes a gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Demings, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you as well to the ranking member of the full committee and to the ranking member of the subcommittee for allowing me to participate in this hearing today. Uh, Admiral, it's good to see you again, and I want to thank you for TSA's rapid response to the Orlando International Airport's requests for additional resources and personnel. 
OIA, like many other airports, as you know, has experienced unprecedented growth over the last decade, and the work of our FSD, our Region 3 Director, the Assistant Administrator, as well as the men and women on the ground, I believe demonstrates the shared commitment to passenger safety, national security, and enhanced customer service. So on behalf of the Orlando delegation, I want to thank you for TSA's commitment to our growing airport. But with the federal airport partnership in mind, I would like to turn to reimbursement for airports that took early action to install inline baggage screening systems but have yet to be reimbursed. Uh, from the start, Congress established that the federal government was responsible for the cost of baggage screening equipment, and Orlando International Airport, with the support of the TSA, procured and installed cutting-edge inline baggage screening equipment. Unfortunately, more than 12 years later, airports like OIA have yet to be reimbursed. In the fiscal year 19 budget, the DS HS budget justification states that reimbursements like those owed to OIA are dead last on the list of funding priorities. And in February of 2018, 14 airports were told funds would not be available until at least 2027. To the relief of many, in fiscal year 18, Ominous provided a $50 million down payment, $50 million down payment for the $218 million owed to airports like Orlando. It is my understanding that the agency is to provide a timeline and methodology for the distribution of the appropriated funds and a plan for the remaining $168 million owed by the end of this month. Admiral, is TSA on track to meet the deadline and will subsequent budget requests reprioritize those reimbursements. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you very much for your comments, uh, first off. And, and secondly, with respect to the uh, EDS reimbursement, yes, $50 million in the omnibus appropriation. Um, and we are ready, I think, next week or the week after to, uh, to brief the committee on how we would propose to disperse those funds. Uh, the, t the sum total is $218 million. And if you just took uh, $50 million for argument's sake and, and said, if I pay $50 million a year, when can this uh, 218 be paid off. It's between four and five years. So between four and five years, not it, 20, 27. Well, if, if we continue with the 50 million, but but as as you know, ma'am, the, the, in the president's budget, there's not a 50 million dollar request for fiscal 19. Admiral, could you talk a little bit about the? You know, I I do believe that our most precious resource um, are the men and women on the job and. Uh, having commanded a police department, um, I understand how, yeah, they're willing to do much more than they're ever paid to do. But a part of morale is making sure that we try our best to pay them what they are worth. Um, could you just talk a little bit uh, about the men and women on the ground at the TSA who do the job every day, the front line in terms of our security, and, and talk a little bit more about some of the direct efforts that you are engaged in directly to understand uh, what's going on with them and to help increase morale or create an environment that increases their morale. Yes, thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Uh, you know, I, I, as I said in my opening statement, we have a fantastic workforce in TSA, 60,000 plus men and women that do a very difficult job under significant pressure, under a no-fail uh, system, uh, and they perform in incredibly well in my view. Uh, it's been my privilege as, since I've been the administrator to be with them a lot. I've, I've traveled to many, many airports, many Federal Air Marshal Services offices, um, and visited our vetting centers. And, and, the, and the thing to think about with TSA is, uh, you know, the image of TSA is the, is the checkpoint, and that's where most American citizens encounter the Transportation Security Administration. But we have many, many layers of security, and there are a lot of people that the traveling public wouldn't necessarily recognize as being in TSA because they're in airports, but they're not in a uniform. But they're ensuring compliance with, with the regulations we place on the airlines and, and uh, uh, at the airports. And additionally, we have a good 
uh, international footprint because we have very strong relationships with our international partners and we are facing a global threat. Um, from my perspective, one of the most important things I can do as the TSA administrator is when I make decisions on things, I make it from the, the, the standpoint of being in the shoes of the men and women who are on the front lines of the agency. Uh, that's what you did as, as, a, as a chief. It's what I did uh, when I was a, a Coast Guard officer. Is I always tried to place myself in, 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 the, in the shoes of, of the person who's directly delivering the services the agency mm -hmm. provides. And so that's the perspective I've taken on everything that I have done. Uh, I, we, we have uh, put together a, a career advancement program for our transportation security officers, the lion's share of our frontline workforce, some 45,000 people. Um, that, that career progression should be released uh, very, very shortly. It, it's, it's signature ready, it just, it, and I've already approved it. It's, it's above me for, for approval. That will map out a career progression for our officers, and it will, will show what training we will provide them and what pay gates they can go through as they advance throughout their careers. Uh, additionally, as, a, as I've looked at the TSA organization, uh, you know, I'm looking for opportunities for how can we organizationally provide more career broadening opportunities for our workforce, and that's a key part of my focus. So I, I hope to leave this agency when my time is up as the administrator, which I hope is no time soon, because I, I really do uh, enjoy this job, and, and, and I, I feel uh, very rewarded by the opportunity to serve the men and women who serve in TSA, um, that our job satisfaction numbers are significantly increased, and I would dearly love to pay uh, our transportation security officers, in particular at the, at the lower pay bands, more money. I just don't have the budget flexibility to do that at this point in time. But if I'm I can find it, I, I will. Yeah. If you had an, I'm sorry, I'm out of town. Uh, yeah, you are, you are out of town. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Demings. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Th this concludes the first panel for today's hearings. Members are advised that we will take a short recess of five minutes or less and begin the second panel. Thank you.
I'd like to welcome our second panel for today's hearing. Our first witness is Mr. Kevin Burke, who is President and CEO of Airports Council International North America. Mr. Burke joined ACINA as President and CEO in January 2014 and has since focused on expanding the organization's reach and influence by amplifying the role of airports in everyday life, as well as unifying and advancing the industry. Prior to joining ACINA, he served for 13 years as President and CEO of the American Apparel and Footwear Association and has more than 30 years of experience in government relations. Mr. Burke is now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. I'll remind both Mr. Burke and Mr. Cox that your, your full statements have been entered into the record. Thank you, um, Chairman Katko, Ranking Member uh, Watson Coleman, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the airport operator's perspective. I'm sorry, Mr. Burke, is your speaker on? Yes, it is. Okay. Oh, can you hear me now? How's that? That better? Good. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide the airport operator's perspective on TSA's fiscal year 2019 budget request. Every day, airports across America operate in a dynamic threat environment that requires a variety of security measures to keep passengers, employees, and facilities safe. To mitigate these threats, airport partners with the TSA, federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, and their airline partners to develop and maintain a comprehensive, multi-layered, and risk-based aviation security system. ACINA and airports appreciate the efforts of Administrator Pekoski and his team to coordinate more closely with industry. Also, members of this committee have implemented measures to make TSA a more effective and more efficient organization. Consistent funding that keeps pace with continued growth in passenger traffic is essential to ensure TSA's long-term success. To that end, Mr. Chairman, ACINA offers the following budget priorities to make the airport environment safer and more secure. Number one, Congress should provide funding for the number of transportation security officers and passenger screening canines necessary to effectively and efficiently screen passengers and baggage. Airports across the country report significantly longer TSA checkpoint wait lines due to the combined effects of insufficient TSA staffing, growing passenger traffic, and increased scrutiny of passengers and their carry-on luggage. Large groups of people waiting at passenger screening checkpoints create an unnecessary security vulnerability. Airports appreciate the efforts of Congress to provide TSA more resources for screening checkpoints, but TSA's own resources allocation model clearly demonstrates that security checkpoints around the country remain understaffed by several thousand TSOs. And we have all seen that ourselves when TSA is routinely unable to open all of the screening lanes at many checkpoints, including pre-check lanes. To help TSA keep pace with the growing volume and security demands, Congress should increase funding for the TSO workforce and passenger screening canines. Number two, Congress should ensure the TSA has the funds necessary to fulfill its obligations to reimburse airports under the law enforcement, law, law enforcement officer reimbursement program. Now, TSA created the LEO reimbursement program to partially reimburse airports providing law enforcement officer staffing to support TSA screening operations. Now, while any, many airports have entered in reimbursable agreements with TSA to assist the agency in meeting its statutory mandate, the reimbursement rate declined dramatically over the past decade, and now the administration has called for the wholesale elimination of what we consider to be a ex very essential program. As security threats at the airport continue to evolve and TSA imposes additional requirements on airport law enforcement officers, it is essential, in our view, for Congress to continue to provide TSA adequate funding for the LEO reimbursement program. Number three, Congress should ensure that TSA continues to staff airport export, um, exit lanes. Airports appreciate the continued support of Congress in, in ensuring that TSA abides by the provision in the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2013 directing the agency to continue to monitor exit lanes. There are potential security issues and significant costs associated with an unfunded mandate for airport operators to provide staff to monitor these exit lanes as called for in this year's budget request. Number four, Congress should provide funding for research development and deployment of new technology capable of detecting emerging threats and increasing efficiency. TSA needs to support programs like its Innovation Task Force to deploy and maintain automated screening lanes, procure and install systems to monitor exit lanes, and accelerate the testing and procurement of CT technology at passenger checkpoints. Developing and installing next-generation technology will increase security, 
It will produce significant budget savings and enhance the traveler convenience and experience at airports. Number five, Congress should ensure TSA has the funds necessary to replace outdated explosive detection systems and reimburse eligible airports for the installation of past systems. TSA needs funding to replace inline check baggage screening systems that have, have or have rapidly reaching the end of their useful lives. We also appreciate Congress providing funding in the 2018 omnibus for TSA to reimburse airports for past EDS deployments, and we encourage Congress to continue to follow through on this commitment with additional funding. In addition to the budget request recommendation I have just detailed, Mr. Chairman, I encourage the committee to consider the authorization recommendations included in my written testimony as it looks to craft additional aviation security legislation this year. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I welcome any questions the committee might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burke. We appreciate your being here today and your testimony, and looking forward to it. Okay. Our second witness is uh, Mr. J. David Cox, who currently serves as the national president of the American Federation of Government Employees. Mr. Cox was first elected president of AFGE in August 2012 and was reelected to a second term in 2015. AFGE has increased its membership by more than 90,000 employees since Mr. Cox was first elected to national office in 2006. As a nationally recognized labor leader, Mr. Cox was appointed by President Obama to serve on the Federal mm -hmm. Salary Council and the Federal Prevailing Wage Council. Mr. Cox is now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman Katko and Ranking Member Watson uh, Coleman and Ranking Member Thompson and Member Estes. Thank you all for having me here today. I always enjoy the Southern hospitality that I experience with this group and the co collegiality that this group always has together and uh, as they go for the interest of the American public. But I want to talk about TSOs. They're the front line of the airport security. They're the eyes, the ears, the hands of TSA at the checkpoints and the baggage areas. They're the most visible of TSA's components and the most likely to be blamed when things go wrong. But we are almost never recognized for the excellent job that they do. I ask that Congress and TSA show their appreciation for TSO's contribution to our nation's security by guaranteeing fair treatment on the job. I also ask that Congress ensure TSOs have the resources they need to carry out their mission. Security, uh, security screening of passengers and baggage was federalized as a consequence of careful examination of our nation's aviation security practices following September 11th. That examination found that fatal security lapses were due to the fact that private screening contractors operated with too little oversight. The screeners they employed had little training, no standard operating procedures, high turnover, and very low pay. For 15 years, TSOs have kept America safe from terrorism and other risks. They get the job done. Their record is one we shall all be uh, applauding today. For example, last year, TSO seized 3,391 firearms at checkpoints, most of them loaded. And they defied projections of long wait times during severe understaffings in last spring and summer uh, as the busiest times of the travel season. Yet there are politicians who continue to try to privatize TSA. Make no mistake, privatization through the Screening Partnership Program takes us back to pre-9-11 conditions. The future of TSA lies with federal employees as TSO and not private contractors. Regarding their treatment on the job, TSA administrators have the option to decide whether to provide fundamental workplace rights and protections to TSOs. These basic rights should not be subject to the whim of whoever happens to sit in the corner office. Employee rights should not be subject to political appointee preferences, but current law allows for this. We ask that TSOs be granted the same statutory rights that protect all federal employees from political influence and employment conditions that vary depending upon which party is in power. AFG recently ratified a contract with TSA by means of a collective bargaining process that is deeply inferior to what that which other government agencies have been able to negotiate uh, with their unions. TSA unilaterally changed and implemented 
rules and consistent with previously uh, agreed upon rules. This reminds TSOs constantly that their own government considers them second-class employees. TSOs should have statutory rights and protections under Title V of the U.S. Code, such as employment discrimination protections and full collective bargaining rights. I want to salute Ranking Member Benny Thompson, Representative Nita Loy, and Senator Brian Schatz for continuing to stand up for the TSO workforce by introducing the Rights for Transportation Security Employees Act and the Strengthening American Transportation Security Act in the House and Senate. Both bills ensure TSOs and all other TSA employees have rights and protections under Title V. I urge you to enact these bills into law. I ask again that Congress and TSA welcome TSOs as full partners in protecting the public. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Cox. We appreciate you being here today. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. I want to talk for a minute about uh, the pre-check program uh, at, uh, and how it impacts personnel issues and personnel levels at the airports. Um, early on, there were some, some prognostications, if you will, that T uh, TSA pre-check could get up to 20 million p uh, enrollees. Uh, uh, we've, we've spent an awful lot of time and effort trying to get those numbers up, and they've gone from less than a million to over 4 million now, but nowhere near the 20 million mark level. And so I was wondering, if, uh, Mr. Burke, if you could tell us what it is um, that they could do better in marketing pre-check, and what do you see problems with the current pre-check program now, and if you could address some of the things that we're concerned about, uh, especially that uh, the, the security issue, and that is individuals being in the pre-check lane that should not be there because they're not enrollees. And uh, the, the, the time of them doing that is going to be ending quickly by law, hopefully, because we're going to introduce some legislation to fix that. But I'd like to hear your take on that, if I will, if you would. Well, Mr. Chairman, to address the first part of your question, uh, we as an organization, airports, have fully supported uh, pre-checks. Uh, we look at the opportunity to be able to move safely and efficiently passengers through the, uh, their lines as the ability to be able to keep people safe at airports. Uh, we have advocated to TSA uh, that they market uh, this program better than they've had. Uh, we have uh, offered, our airports have offered space for people to enroll at airports as they get there, um, free of charge. They open up an office, you can enroll. Um, I have offered the advice to TSA that why don't we do the same thing that the uh, the folks in customs do with uh, with their um, passports and be able to go to a local post office to be able to begin the application process. Um, eventually, you'll have to go to an airport for an interview, but to begin the process, because most people that we want to have join TSA PreCheck don't travel as much as I do. I travel all year long. But we have people who infrequently do it who would benefit greatly from the ability to do that. Um, so we advocate better marketing of the program. The numbers are better. They can do much, much better. And the challenge is, though, even with marketing uh, TSA PreCheck, TSA has to have the officers and the ability to man those PreCheck lanes. And you, it's, it's great to have PreCheck, but if you don't have TSOs to be able to support that, then the program is effective, but not as effective as it could be. So better marketing, the ability for us to be able to, and TSA, to get more people in line, making it easier for the traveling public to become part of the program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything you'd like to add, Mr. Cox? Uh, I would agree uh, with the statement, even with the pre-check, as that lane moves a little faster, you still have to have employees. There still has to be the screener there, the person monitoring the folks going through the screening, uh, uh, the checking the baggage. Uh, it moves faster, but if you don't have employees or the lanes are closed at certain hours, they're still of no benefit. So and that's the first lanes they'll close down in many airports that I go through, and I'm in airports virtually every day of my life, uh, that's the lane that'll get closed the quickest, uh, and they'll funnel the passengers into the other lane. So you still have to have the staff, and TSA is about 5,000 less screeners now than they were several years ago. And uh, I want to follow up uh, basically on a more broader topic here, Mr. Burke, first. Uh, the um, stakeholder engagement in the budget process, could you describe if you've had any engagement whatsoever in the, in the, in the process or any input? Uh, and uh, the same question would be for Mr. Cox as well. Well, in terms of direct impact, uh, we have staff who talk to TSA and the administration about the need for airports. We have advocated for more officers. We have advocated for um, Congress to continue to fund uh, exit lanes, uh, more LEO reimbursement. 
uh, because we see that as essential to help our TSA officers at the front lines of security at airports. So we have advocated as an industry that the more security we have at airports, the safer passengers are. We have transmitted that message to TSA and the administration. We began the, um, the administration with a list of regulatory uh, changes what we were hoping uh, would happen, and in that recommendation are how we deal with TSA. Uh, we view TSA as a partner. We have a very good relationship with them. Um, we have uh, nearly 900 million people that pass through U.S. airports every year. So the job that TSA does to secure the safety of these people from the beginning when they enter the airport from the time they step on the plane is an enormous responsibility. We view this as an airport being able to work with a regulatory agency like TSA together with our on-site law enforcement people as a multi-prong, multi-ring ability to be able to secure the airport, whether it be through cameras, whether it be through dog patrols, whether it be through officers in the, uh, walking through uh, the airport. But we have expressed our, uh, can, uh, our position that more needs to be done, more officers to my, uh, my colleague's position here. More officers need to be put in place to protect the traveling public. Okay, briefly, Mr. Cox, I, I only have a few moments. Anything you like to add? Uh, we advocate, we write letters we, uh, uh, to all the members of Congress as well as to the administration, but an active role into the budget process, no, sir, we don't. And I would say I suspect each one of you, as you plan for your budget for your office, you sit down with your staff and you start projecting the needs for the coming year and look to those people that help you do that work. I think TSA needs to look to the TSOs through their exclusive representative, AFGE. What would it take to run a successful TSA? Thank you very much. I, I would be remiss if I did not note, as I try to at every hearing, the incredibly great job that TSOs do under very difficult circumstances, and uh, they are constantly trying to find the, the proverbial needle in a haystack under stressful and difficult conditions, and it's, uh, it's a, they do a remarkably good job with, with uh, what they're faced with, so I, I appreciate them. The Chair now recognizes a gentleman from Mississippi, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, both, for being here. Uh, Mr. Cox, it's always nice to get a witness that has the same accent as the ranking member. So <laughs> I'm more than happy to, to, to be here. Um, you heard my line of questioning to the administrator relative to uh, uh, pay, longevity pay, uh, evaluations, uh, pay scale. Uh, what was your reaction to his answers to me? I believe that the administrator would like to pay the employees more money, uh, but I heard him say, but I only have so much money. If the TSOs were on the Title V pay scale, when Congress did its budget, as it did a few weeks ago, it passed the budget, the TSOs would have gotten their cost of living raises, they would have gotten their within grade raises, they would have gotten those things like all other federal employees would have received. It wouldn't have been a burden upon an administrator to decide I can or can't give but so much to so many and the haves and the haves nots. They should be treated like all other federal employees. So is your testimony that you're not asking for anything more uh, for the people you represent other than what other federal employees enjoy every day at that's, the workplace. That's exactly right. Like all other federal employees, Border Patrol, ICE agents, Coast Guard agents, uh, uh, all of those folks in Homeland Security are on the GS pay system. Uh, thank you, Mark. Mr. Burks, do you support the uh, um, collection of uh, passenger security fees? Do we support? Well, absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, we've expressed concern about the diversion of the security fees that should be going to TSA that, are, that have been diverted to go to other programs. That's the second part of my question. Oh, okay. Uh, I've read your mind. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so the diversion going to deficit reduction versus uh, uh, items that you were about to illuminate, 
would be a far better use in your uh, professional opinion than what it's presently going to. That's correct. I yield back. Let the record reflect, it's the first time I've seen you not use all your time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Watson Coleman for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, and it is good to see you, Mr. Cox, and it's good to hear from you, Mr. Burke. Um, Mr. Cox, the, um, the employee disciplinary uh, process um, for TSOs, is that different than it is for other federal employees? Yes, ma'am, it is. How so? It is, uh, well, it changes by the hour. It can change totally at the, the desire of the administrator or the administrator's general counsel. Uh, it goes through uh, the, these uh, resolution committees. They can, they can decide to accept it or just totally reject it. It's, uh, uh, it's very much of a kangaroo court. Does that contribute to the uh, concern with morale? Yes, ma'am, it does, because um, they're not treated fairly like everyone else. So there was a, a ranking that was done, and TSO, TSA was ranked like 339, something of that? 336 out of 339. But it was ranked dead last because of the pay scale? Uh, the pay scale and also uh, the, the work rules that TSA has. Like what? Work rules. Uh, the work rules uh, governing collective bargaining. They don't have full Title V collective bargaining rights. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't have the appeal rights that other federal employees Do you have any have. negotiation ability? Uh, we have. Uh, we negotiate mm -hmm. over when you can wear shorts and when you can wear long pants and when you can wear a short sleeve shirt and when you can wear a long sleeve shirt according to the temperature in the work area. So the, uh, the president's budget in a number of ways I found very troubling. One of the ways, one of the issues that I found particularly tr uh, troubling was the reduction of the reimbursements to the local uh, enforcement officers. And so I'm wondering how does the, 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 the LEO reimbursement uh, diminishment impact the safety and security of the TSO officers? Our, our officers, our members are dependent upon local law enforcement for the protection. We've uh, obviously, I think we're all very much aware of what happened in Los Angeles and what happened in New Orleans, that uh, we've had uh, one officer uh, killed, other officers injured, uh, and but for uh, police being in that area, local law enforcement intervening and moving forward, uh, I think things could have been a lot worse. And uh, uh, that local law enforcement is uh, the only uh, the only uh, uh, people that uh, have weapons and are, are have arrest authority of those type things for the protection of not just TSOs but the American traveling public. So, how many TSOs are there? There's right at 44,000. There are 44,000. And how many would you consider to be full staffing? Uh, right now, I'd say we are down right at about 5,000 from where we were at several years ago. Was that, was that full staff? Uh, that, would, uh, that was when uh, the agency was beginning and uh, pretty much full staffing. And there's a lot more air traffic now and more passengers than there was five years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think I've got the message as it relates to the sort of unpredictability and anxiety this creates for employees um, and the system and how it is really controlled by individual decisions, individual preferences. Thank you very much for that. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Watson Coleman. And the chair now recognizes a gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, for questioning. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Burke, Recently, you spoke at the 2018 uh, Aviation Summit and, and mentioned that uh, you know, some of the key issues are work-facing industry now, or workforce planning, security, facilitation, and infrastructure. Can you talk a little bit about how well the President's budget is addressing that, those particular issues that you're, uh, you raised there? Well, uh, Mr. Estes, not as well as we'd like them to be. Um, I'll start with infrastructure. Um, 
the president, as a candidate, and um, as a president, talked about rebuilding America's airports through an infrastructure package. We haven't seen one yet. Hopefully, we'll have one. Uh, but uh, also, too, Congress had the opportunity several weeks ago through the omnibus bill to uh, modernize the passenger facility user fee, which all passengers pay um, as a user fee to pass through our airports. That fee was instituted nearly 20 years ago, and that fee has not increased in, uh, in 18 and a half years. It's at $4.50. We advocated a $4 increase. That money would go to modernizing America's airports. Um, the average age of a terminal in the United States is over 40 years old. Uh, those airports were created before they had TSA, before we had the security uh, concerns post 9-11. Yet all of those airports have had to figure a way to adapt their aging infrastructure to the requirements of TSA on one side of the airport, Customs and Border Protection at the other end, with little or no increase in their PFC, to, which is used to build out terminals. Uh, there are times, like for example in Syracuse, in um, Mr. Ka Chairman Katko's district, where some of those funds are used for exit lane technology. Uh, now we fully support uh, paying for exit lanes. Congress approved it back in 2013. We fully support that. But the, in the future, technology is an opportunity or, or a choice for airports to be able to change. And Mr. Katko goes through that security system every week, and it's, and it's actually paid for itself through this fee. Yet Congress had an opportunity to fix that at no cost to the federal government, and it didn't make it through the omnibus process, it, it, nor did it make it through the authorization process through the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. So I look at it, our industry looks at it as this is a 21st century world. We're dealing with airports that were built in the 20th century, and we have to take the infrastructure and modernize it to be able to make it efficient and safe for the traveling public. So when I look at what's happened, uh, we were excited about rebuilding airports. The president during his campaign spoke, I think it was over 200 times, about us being third world airports. We figured this is great. We're going to be able to get money. We're going to be able to increase the PFC. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. Our expectation is that over time we'll be able to do that. But in order for us to be able to keep um, our passengers, our customers safe, there's a host of things we have to do. The first start is, is making certain that the facilities that we're providing TSA and Customs are, are that, that, that makes it easier for them to do their jobs. It makes it safer for passengers to get through the airport in a safe and efficient manner. I hope that answers your question, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cox, I um, have a couple of questions for you. I may, I may start with one just in case we run out of time, which wasn't necessarily the one I wanted to start with. But you'd mentioned uh, about private screeners versus versus uh, uh, you know TSO, you know federally employed TSO agents, and and I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, you were a very strong advocate that uh, we needed to not be using private screeners, and I wanted to make sure that we weren't missing the boat somewhere in these airports that currently do have them are, are there is it a training issue that the private folks uh, don't have is it are, are there are there tools they don't have resources they don't have uh, procedures that we uh, don't require them to follow that uh, makes it such a, a strong concern and and you know do we need to do something now with those facilities that do use uh, there were several airports, as you well know, that uh, in the very beginning that uh, remained with private screeners. Uh, they were various size as sort of a test. Some, I believe it was Montana that came in and asked to go private and then came back later on and said it's not working for us. We want TSA to take that back over again. Uh, occasionally, uh, uh, Kansas City went up for bids several years ago, and it was a bidder that uh, bid less and got the contract, and they were struggling to already staff, and uh, the uh, people were saying now it's going to be even harder to staff to pay that staff less. There's also, there's not the mobility that some people, uh, their lives change. They work in New York, and now uh, something has happened. They want to work in uh, 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 Arizona, they have the ability to transfer to another airport just as government employees do in all other government agencies. They don't have that with the private screeners. Uh, and we believe that um, it's proven that uh, they were federalized and uh, the government has done that simply because the private process was not working effectively throughout this country. We saw what happened and I think TSA has a record that's uh, 
that's proven to be great that this country's had no air uh, terrorism since uh, we've been doing it uh, with uh, professional staff. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time. Uh, I did have one more question if you wanted to allow that or if we were doing a second round. Uh, <laughs> very, very briefly, thank you. Uh, please. I, my, my question, and hopefully this doesn't go too long, I just, are there additional training needs that we might have for the TSO agents that we can address? And uh, I think, I think training is always an issue for any employee because I, I'm a registered nurse, worked for the VA, but still yet when there were veterans to be cared for and they were coming in faster than we were able to take care of them, if it was my day to go to training, I had to take care of the veterans. There's never a shortage of passengers to be screened in an airport. So there's always going to be a, a rush to, to go on. Training has to be planned for in any organization. And I think it's imperative with the technology as it changes almost by the moment uh, in uh, the screening industry that all the, the TSOs constantly have the chance to go to be retrained, to have the refresher training, to do those type things, uh, to, to be good and to be the experts because, as the chairman said, uh, they they do a great job. I couldn't do that job. I, I look at that, I, I have no idea what's on that screen, but I know they get me safely from one point to the other. And Mr. Chairman, it, can I say to this committee, it is always a joy to come and testify before this group. We have a lot of partisanism and, and all type things in, in our government. But I have never come to this committee that it hasn't been a great experience, and every member of the committee is always concerned about the American public, and that's a lot for every member that serves on this committee, sir. Thank, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cox. I want to thank the witnesses for their thoughtful testimony today. Members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask them to respond to those in writing. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days. Without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>